Our next speaker today is Dr. Daniel Radeska. Dr. Radeska is an international lecturer and physician specializing in palliative care. He was trained in hypnotherapy by Michael Yapko and Jeffrey Zieg, and currently serves as secretary of the Clinical Hypnosis Association in the USA. He is also founder and co-director of the Hypnosis Center of Uruguay, a reference center for clinical hypnosis in South America. He is the creator of Attention Focalization Training, AFT, and the Attention Focalization Training for med Medics, an intensive self-hypnosis training system to reduce burnout. In the abstract for this talk, Dr. Rodeska writes, when a patient's condition has evolved to the point where there is no return, they may be struggling with symptoms that can be physically, psychologically, and spiritually burdensome. As therapists or physicians, we need tools for assessing these symptoms and providing support, care tailored to specific patients. Hypnosis is an outstanding strategy, one we can use to help patients live more comfortably despite their advanced illness. By the end of this lecture titled Hypnosis in Palliative Care, you will have learned specific techniques for dealing with pain, anxiety, depression in patients with life-threatening illnesses. You will discover the latest research in hypnosis and palliative care and learn the best evidence-based strategies for hypnotically approaching these patients. I pass you over now to Dr. Daniel Rudeska for his talk titled Hypnosis and Palliative Care. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm going to share the screen now. Thank you. Hello. Um, Dr. Daniel Rudeska, you, you there? Yeah, you hear Maybe, me? Maybe uh, we could try to get you speaking close to your mic. Oh, that would be, uh, oh, be perfect. It sounds really good right now. Thank you. Oh, thank you. No problem. Wait a minute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do the, the audio settings and all of that. Yeah. Wait a minute. Um, let me see. Do you hear me better? Oh, much better. Much, much better. Oh, Thank you so excellent. much for that, yeah. No, that's okay. I'm going to share the screen here. Wait a minute. Um, so, I'm going to put it right here. So excellent. So well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, congratulations to the entire team for organizing an international event of this magnitude. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Um, I would like to start with uh, um, an experiment, um, an imagination experiment. Um, imagine that situation. Um, you have been experiencing some comfortable, let's suppose, non-specific symptoms and your doctor ordered some test. Try to imagine the next moment. Y you are sitting in front of your doctor waiting for an answer. And uh, can you imagine that situation? Y you may suspect something, but you are absorbed, focused, waiting for an answer when suddenly the first three sentences that come out of his mouth are the results of the test were not good. You have an incurable disease. There's nothing we can do. At that precise moment, an imprint is generated in your life experience and that can trigger a series of consequences that could have been prevented. Communication in palliative care is vital, just like any medication or procedure. As you know, unintentionally, but very commonly, healthcare professionals design negative yes sets. In this example, it's true that the results of the test were not good. It's true that it's a, an incurable disease, that's not a yes. So, and therefore, there is a high probability that your mind 
will accept the wrong idea that there is nothing we can do. Let me say something. If tomorrow someone told you that you have an incurable disease with a limited life expectancy, I assure you that there are so many things that can be done. I think that most um, professionals, I mean, just healthcare professionals, do not assess the impact that our words have on the patient. For example, in this research, um, I think it's a wonderful one. It's uh, from uh, 2018. It's, uh, it's a really good one. 53 healthcare, I mean, I, I think it was 53 healthy volunteers were asked to perform movement with the right finger, index finger, against a piston connected to a force transducer. The researchers placed an electrode um, on the participant's index finger and generated an electrical stimulation. But that electrical stimulation frequency does not have any effect on the strength or anything. But one group of participants received verbal information that the electrical stimulation would have increased their force. That's a positive verbal suggestion. Whereas the other group received a verbal information that the electrical stimulation would have decreased their force. That's a negative verbal suggestion. So we have two groups here with different suggestions, decreasing force and uh, empowering. And as you can see here, look at the green circles. Represent the strength recorded after receiving a positive verbal suggestion. There is no significant difference. Look at the purple triangles and see how just one negative suggestion impacts on their performance. As you can see, the study shows that verbal suggestion play a prominent role worsening the motor performance. That's the nocebo effect. So the, the, the words associated with the effects of a treatment should be chosen just carefully in order to avoid a negative outcome. But what is most surprising is that research data shows that healthcare professionals are not aware of the communication inefficacy. I mean, especially in their practice, for example, 35% of cancer patients receiving palliative care believed that their treatment was curative, while in 98% of these cases, the physicians believed that they had correctly described the disease to the patient. So we know that we have to improve our communication. What we say have an impact on patients, that's our reality. As healthcare professionals, we are not aware of our own communication inefficacy. That's the starting point, a fragile communication baseline. So, to clarify terms, let's start by defining what palliative care is. As you can see here, Palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families, especially their, who's, I mean, those people who are facing problems associated with life-threatening illness. It prevents and relieves suffering through the early identification, the correct assessment and treatment of pain and, and other problems, whether physical, psychosocial, or spiritual. And as you know, Addressing suffering involves taking care of issues beyond physical symptoms. Palliative care uses um, most of the time a team approach to support patients and their caregivers. And this kind of things includes addressing practical needs and providing grief counseling. We offer um, a support system to help patients live as actively as possible until death. But how does hypnosis fit into this approach? Clinical hypnosis focused on the World Health Organization global perspective of palliative care. It's, um, as, you, as you can see there, it provides relief from pain and other distressing symptoms. It established that life and dying are an open process, and that's very important here. It intends neither to hasten or postpone death, it can integrate the psychosocial and spiritual aspect of patient care. Hypnosis most of the time offers a support system to help patients live as actively as possible until death. 
it can be useful as a support system to help the family cope just during the patient's illness and their own grief. And we use a team approach to address the need of patients and their families. And obviously, hypnosis enhances quality of life. But here we have the possible application. Hypnosis is used synergistically with other treatments in clinical practice. It can enhance the use of medical advice as well as pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions. So the possible applications of hypnosis in palliative care and supportive care are symptom control. Here we have the nausea and vomiting, pain, fatigue, breathlessness, and poor sleep. Managing adverse effects or fears about treatment, anticipatory vomiting from chemotherapy, um, neonal phobia, mask phobia, and for example, fear of enclosure and embryos. Mm, it, reduce, um, it reduces uh, medication needs during procedures. It can be an adjunct or a replacement, as you can um, see to sedation during gastroscopy, colonoscopies, and minor surgery. Hypnosis supports self-management of difficult situations or feelings such as depression, stress, anxiety, fear, panic, um, managing difficult personal relationships, and so on. And uh, it can improve general health. For example, supporting um, exercise, eating habits, and sleep quality. Here, but especially from the point of view of neuroscience research, we know that clinical hypnosis can be useful in palliative care in four main areas. We know that response preparation is a key predictor of hypnotic response. We know that expectations shape our experience of the world and influence the quality of hypnotic responses. Evidence shows how preparing participants, providing information about hypnosis, enhances hypnotic response. I believe that clinicians should mobilize this principle by establishing a hypnotic context and maximize the therapeutic outcome, especially in this area. The, the, the mental imagery and hypnotic response, that's very important, but because when we talk about mental imagery, we, it refers to the generation of internal mental representation as a perceptual experience. For example, evidence confirms that mental visualizations represent a powerful mechanism for regulating pain. And that's very important, especially when we are talking about um, palliative care. Regulation of hypnotic processes. One striking feature of hypnosis is that hypnotic suggestion can regulate automatic cognitive processes. Practitioners can use this aspect of hypnosis as a tool to target ingrained thought patterns and maladaptive behaviors that have become highly automatized, such as uh, rumination. In, in palliative care, where patients must confront the, the psychosocial, existential, and physical aspect of the dying experience, and hypnosis can be an excellent tool to help patients get out of that automatic spiral of negative thinking. And uh, last but not least, the precision of hypnotic response. And that's very important because hypnosis can selectively target precise moment um, and especially precise mental processes leading to focal outcomes. The, the, the research shows that a suggestion can lead individuals to achieve a variety of very precise hypnotic responses. For example, empirical evidence demonstrates that this precision impacts at many sensory domains, cognitive processes, and idiomotor processing. So, hypnosis has the potential to dissociate between subjective and sensory experience. This holds powerful clinical applications for palliative care. While most of the time the peripheral pain terminal illness is inevitable, hypnosis can effectively contain the effective component of pain. But, you know, we talk about hypnosis and it's all the, the wonderful things that we can do with, but despite its potential advantages, 
Hypnosis is not widely used in palliative care. This is mainly due to three reasons. It's not routinely introduced as a therapeutic option in medical schools or on specialist training programs. It may also be because it's misunderstood or stigmatized by its unfortunate associations in the land media with the, the show business. And uh, because hypnosis lies under the myth that the client hands over control of their mind to another powerful individual, I mean, who is in his imagination, forces him to perform acts and theatrical uh, to his belief system and normal behavior. So I believe that the first step for hypnosis to access healthcare system is to organize meetings with leading professionals and the general public with, with the aim of creating informative talks about hypnosis as a tool, creating a special section with those talks to remove myth and talk about the, the, the real scope. So, now let's suppose that tomorrow you have a patient with a life-threatening illness. What would be a basic structure of a first session? Look at that five points here. It's very important because I think that that's a very simple structure that it's very useful most of the time. I would like to share that basic structure that I use, I think, 80% of the time in a first hypnotic session in palliative care. The key here is to keep it simple, as you can see. But in most cases, this first session in the, the, in the patient's um, experience, it's the first contact with hypnosis. So before starting, it's important to explain what hypnosis is and what it's not, as well as its realistic scope. So, but before I start, as you can see, that's, the, the, that's not the point number one, that's the point zero. I, I would ask them to describe the place where they think they will be most calm, peaceful, and relaxed, or the perfect place for them to spend their time. Besides, I, ask, I would ask them to nominate a color that represents fear, stress, or anxiety, or anger for them, just their strongest negative emotion. This is often red, black, or gray, but it doesn't matter. Then I ask them to nominate a color that represent peace, calm, or relaxation. I su suggest that they, they can close their eyes and that's when the induction start. Um, I ask them to start breathing in the good color and breathing out the bad one with the suggestion of feeling increasingly relaxed. Then, most of the time, we will go deeper by going down to stairs. This is usually, I mean, they usually go down 20 steps, and with each number, it's synchronized with each exhalation. And when we finally reach step number one, a door opens and the person can enjoy their safe place. The idea here is to use the patient's words and avoid describing the specific scenes that most of the time may separate them from their inner process. Once uh, they are there in their special place or safe place, I would start giving tailored suggestions and specific imagery based on what the patient and I have discussed beforehand. One particular feature of Houston hypnosis, that's the, the point number five, um, is to implant post-hypnotic suggestions. That is, I mean, as you know, actions that the patient can take after the session has ended, link it to um, an everyday activity. For example, every time you turn on your computer, you will remember how you're breathing in your good color. Or every time you wash your hand, you will remember how you are washing away your fear, and so on. The idea here is to relate one thing with another one. And as you can see, I believe that this is a very good structure to start with and allow us to adapt it to each patient. But in most cases, I personally believe that the first session, something like that, should not exceed 15 minutes in length. Because it, it, just keep it simple, that's the idea here. But although this is a basic structure, the approach to the patient will depend on what stage they are in. And we are not talking about the stage of a cancer or something, that's different. Here we have um, 
what we, we, we have been working with um, for a long time, but it's the four-stage crisis model. This is a naturalistic solution-oriented model of hypnotic intervention. Let's start defining crisis in this case. Um, crisis is defined as a response to hazardous events and its experiences as a painful state. A crisis state tends to mobilize powerful reactions to help the person relieve the discomfort and return to the state of emotional equilibrium, that, that, that equilibrium that existed prior to the advent of the crisis. But if the individual is unable to resolve the crisis and use maladaptive reaction, the painful state will intensify, the crisis deepens, and the condition exacerbates itself. So, for a few years now, we have been using the four-stage model which has been very useful for approaching patients in palliative care. But let's see the different stages. Stage number one, that's the initial crisis phase. It's uh, generally preceded with the confirmation of the palliative designation of the disease, but this phase is, is um, typically characterized by shock, denial, disorientation, and a disruptive impact on supportive relationships. The, the diagnosis has a profound psychosocial impact, causing um, a significant biographical disruption. There are often important losses associated with the diagnosis, uh, employment changing, some relationship may end, and um, an individual may lose their strong sense of a previous identity. There will often be um, financial pressures and it prompts difficult existential questions, uh, um, a loss of or a new adherence to a religion. The, the family relationships can shift helpfully or in, in, in a disruptive way and most of the time it's very painful. So, something important here is that a large majority of terminally ill patients, we are talking about 80%, are not afraid of death. But they are, they have, most of the time, they may fear the process of dying. Patients are afraid of the prolonged dying process. So when the patient raises the topic of death, we can elaborate on it by inquiring about the reasons underlying their fears. For example, if someone asks, I'm going to die, or how long have I got? You can use a turning back question such as, what makes you ask that question? And this turning back question may start a deep and rich communication tailored to the actual need of the patients. Here, the hypnotic interventions are aimed um, especially at helping the patient reframe the diagnosis as an opportunity to enjoy and appreciate the time they have left. Intensive training, the use of hypnosis begins at this time especially when the patient is exposed to a variety of hypnotic phenomena that, that could be useful, such as time distortion, dissociative phenomena, and uh, another kind of relaxation hypnotic strategies. Here is when we initiate an intensive training in self-hypnosis. Here we have the stage number two. The transitional stage occurs after the denial of the initial stage has dissipated. Strong emotional reactions are very common here. These are behaviors that are not unlike the traditional grief or loss reactions. Here we could find the feelings of desperation, um, desperation, isolation, hopelessness. Uh, another issue may be social rejection from traditional support system. So our treatment goals here for this phase aims to maximize psychosocial function using hypnosis for adaptation and exploration of feelings. Some of these goals include stress reduction and an active investment in personal wellness. Hypnotic intervention, especially in this case, um, frequently involve a metaphorical journey such as the transformation of a chrysalis to butterfly and we have so many different metaphors. And now we have a stage number three, that's the acceptance. Patients are not as likely to initiate, I mean, present, initially present uh, for therapy in this, uh, in this phase, in this stage, because acceptance of one's terminal status is not a one-time event, but a process. 
So for those patients who do achieve a measure of acceptance, the focus of the intervention shift to leaving and maintaining gains in the face of a repeated challenges on all fronts, social, economic, physical, and spiritual. This is done in the face of knowledge that there will be further physical setbacks. So the approach of this phase is to implement a philosophy of supported empowerment. Hypnotic intervention focused on the use of self-hypnosis for the, the management of the, of the body functioning. And this is, a, this is encouraged through the, the process of inviting the patient to hypnotically listen and respond to the body's wisdom. And here we have the stage number four, the preparation for death. The main issue here is symptom control. In, in this stage of the crisis matrix, uh, the, the, um, the focus of the intervention is completely changed. In the previous three stages, the emphasis has been on appreciation of living. The ghost of death has always been uh, in evidence, but in this stage, it comes to the forefront of the therapeutic arena. Here, assisting the patients um, through their own death and dying process through the uh, visualization and hypnosis could be uh, most of the time the best option. The pain management becomes a primary uh, issue. So uh, hypnotically assisted dissociation from the pain is a crucial element. We could invite patients to hypnotically go to the future and visualize family members coping with their demise. This can be very helpful um, and they feel more at ease with their pending death. Uh, it reduced their, their stress and vulnerability to the disease process. But beyond the different phases, uh, patients in palliative care has to face multiple procedures during the course of the disease. In this case report, the midline catheter was the intervention tool chosen by the medical team as the most appropriate for applying intravenous drugs in order to relieve symptoms, which was the, the main objective of the treatment for this patient. Um, but after a failed attempt to place two central venous catheters, um, the, the patient exhibited high anxiety and refused its placement. In this study, it has been shown that clinical hypnosis is a simple intervention that it's easy to apply, accepted by the patient, which, which solved the phobic behavior associated with puncture procedures and improved patient general well-being. Long story short about that patient, the patient was able to achieve better control of his symptoms and greater comfort at the end of his life. This was a, a non-randomized clinical trial because participants could choose, in this case, that's, that's why it, it was not, uh, not non-randomized, could choose which group they wanted to be. So the researchers organized two groups, each with 25 patients suffering from severe chronic illnesses, especially those who are evolving into pain and anxiety. But all the patients of both groups were treated as outpatient referred to a pain therapy clinic with conventional pharmacological therapy, opioids, NSAIDs, and corticosteroids. But for two years, a series of weekly two-hour workshops were conducted on chronic pain assessment and the management of anxiety. And in this group of patients, they use uh, some di different kind of tools with uh, hypnosis and self-hypnotic uh, techniques. As you can see there below the blue arrows, the, that work demonstrates that clinical hypnosis is an emerging field for pain and anxiety relief as an adjuvant therapy to medicines in palliative care. And all that was uh, in just one year. Uh, Dr. This, Daniel, oh yeah, sorry to interrupt you. Um, just a polite reminder that we've got about five more minutes Excellent. No. your presentation, and then I'll put some questions to you. Excellent. This study found a significant reduction in level of anxiety and other troublesome symptoms after only two hypnotherapy sessions, and they also found a significant reduction in depression and an increase in sleep quality after four hypnotherapy sessions. And that, I think that's incredible because it's very specific. And about depression, although depression in palliative care can be treated successfully with medication and psychotherapy, 
a significant number of depressives do not respond to the medication or existing psychotherapies. This is not surprising considering depression is a complex disorder. But moreover, the presentation of depression in palliative care is compounded by the severity of underlying medical conditions. It's important for clinicians to continue to develop more effective treatments for depression in palliative care. And in this article, the author described cognitive hypnotherapy, an evidence-based multimodal treatment for depression, which has a, a lot of different uh, of advantage and it could be applied to a wide range of depressed patients in palliative care. And uh, the evidence on hypnosis in palliative care also applies to the pediatric population. At least 8 million children will need a specialized pediatric palliative care service annually worldwide. And as, as you may know, unfortunately, even in resource-rich countries, most, ch most children dying especially from serious advanced illnesses, are suffering from unrelieved distressing symptoms such as pain, dyspnea, nausea, vomiting, and anxiety. Hypnosis for pediatric patients experiencing life-limiting disease not only provides a useful part of advanced symptoms management, but also supports children dealing with loss and anticipatory loss, and that enhances hope and helps children to live fully, making just every moment count until death. But one important question here, is hypnosis compatible with uh, National Health Service practice? Many clinicians interested in using hypnosis are concerned about its possible time demands when their everyday clinical work feel pressurized and it's perhaps easier to incorporate into palliative care where clinicians have more autonomy over the use of their clinical time we have longer individual consultation, and we have a detailed psychosocial history. And this is very helpful to create tailored hypnosis sessions. And one question that I think is very important here is how many sessions are needed and how often should they be given? Um, here, that depends on plenty of different things, but it's important to know that the number of sessions uh, will, will be based on the clinical need, uh, the progress with, the, uh, with um, the ability to control the symptom through hypnosis, and that's really important now, how often the patient can come, um, the personal choice, and obviously the clinician time constraint. And how often, that's really important now, because as you can see here, wait a minute, oh yeah, um, ideally, at the beginning of the treatment, it's good to give people sessions reasonably close together. If they are in the hospital and very unwell, a daily short session is better than one hour once a week. It does it take a lot of training to be able to use hypnotic language and perform effective intervention? In this research, 49 patients with different cancer types were recruited, and all nurses were trained to include a five-minute hypnotherapy session. That's all. That was an intervention into their chemotherapy protocols. Their findings suggest that hypnosis is feasible and well accepted by oncology nurses working at the outpatient oncology unit. And this study also demonstrated that with only eight hours of hypnotherapy communication training, nurses were able to use and make a difference in patient well-being during chemotherapy. So we, we learned a lot of different things. and. Uh, the aim of this talk was to show you how clinical hypnosis can be an excellent tool in palliative care and especially at the end of life. We learned that you can use a basic structure, but if you want to go deeper into the topic, you can use a four-stage crisis model to adapt it to the stage that the patient is going through. As we have seen, hypnosis in palliative care can be used in different things symptom control, we, we, we were talking about management of adverse effects or fears about treatment. We talked that it can reduce medication needs during procedures. And we know that it can support self-management and that's very important, the self-management of difficult situation or feelings. And obviously it improves overall health. So it's possible to use and include hypnosis in palliative care within current 
healthcare system. And today we know that it's possible to create simple hypnotic languages. And, and, and all of that, it's just a simple training where a very small investment of time could have a great direct benefit on our patient and their quality of life. And for the end of this talk, I would like to share, I think um, it's a wonderful quote for Cecily Sanders that goes like this. You matter because you are you and you matter to the end of your life. We will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but also to live until you die. I think it was, uh, it is a, a very pleasure for any questions or query, save my personal email, send me an M a message and let's keep in touch. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to share all of that with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodesco. It's, it's been an absolute um, pleasure and an honor to have been able to have you join us today. Um, you know, we, we had another hypnotherapist from um, Australia yesterday, Kathy Brown, who spoke about her work, and she's a, a cancer survivor. Um, and I'm sure, you know, again, I, I found yours very, um, you know, but also someone in our lives is affected by cancer. Um, in so many of our lives that it's it's often challenging to sit and, and listen about it but it's also inspiring because you know I everyone deserves that compassion and that time invested in them so so thank you for sharing some insight into the wonderful work you're doing with us with 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 cancer patients um yeah. I have some questions for you Oh, I've got you. one here, um, which actually is is very much based on um, the use of language, and and indeed um, it delves into the the use of the words in Spanish. So um, mm -hmm. this is from Silvana Forlini, who's with us today. Mm -hmm. um, to promote dissociation in English, we tend to we tend to allow we tend to use words such as allow those eyes, allow those legs, or allow those hands instead mm -hmm. of your eyes, your legs, your hands. In Spanish, we don't say tus ojos, we already say los ojos. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on this? Thank you. Well, that's a, that's a really good question because uh, we can translate that in Spanish too, but we can use that. Um, we, we call something in, 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 in hypnosis that it's nominal. I mean, you, you can, um, an inanimate object such as um, um, sofa or something, you can say, well, you can feel the support of that sofa. That's, that's one way to um, uh, create some kind of uh, animation and give some uh, kind of, of power to something that it's an uh, inanimate object. That's one way to dissociate. And we can do that in Spanish. We can say something in Spanish. I'm going to say that in Spanish too, but it's uh, for, for her. It's, uh, you can say, um, puedes permitir que tus ojos, you can allow that your eyes. O puedes decir esta frase, puedes permitir que los ojos. In Spanish, it's, it's, it's closely the same, but it's not exactly the same because you are separating from the, the, the experience. And we have so many different ways just to split the, the, um, the person and dissociate from the, their own uh, physical reality. And I think it is possible. And if you have any doubt or something, just send me an email and we can talk that uh, in, the Spanish, in the Spanish, especially how to do it. But there is no problem. I think it, it's possible. We can do it. Thank you. Um I've got a couple of questions here related to hypnosis and faith. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to put both of them to you because they're, they're, they're both quite linked. Mm -hmm. um, I've got one here. Can you, do you have any thoughts on acceptance of hypnosis by different religious institutions? Mm -hmm. And well, mm -hmm. no, sorry, go on. No, 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 go on, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. And I'm just sorry, I'm just trying to find the other one that we've got here. Yes. How do you integrate faith and hypnotherapy, especially hypnotic suggestions and cognitive processes? 
Well, that, that's a really good question. I think it's, a, it's really important, especially because we do not, I, I do not try to impose, and especially I, I, I do not link both worlds together because sometimes if we are not really involved with, with different religions, we can make a mistake and that's not really good when we are talking about belief systems. So we, I, I do not do that most of the time, but if I believe that I know something that it could be useful for that person, especially, um, for example, you can use a lot of different kind of metaphors in, in, in different, uh, with, depending on different language or different religion or different. In Hebrew, for example, you can, um, we know that there is no dirty words. In, in, so it's a sacred language. And so I, I don't know in another language, but it's, I, I know that in Hebrew that, that there is no dirty words. So when, when we know that something, we can protect a language so you can do a lot of different kind of metaphors around that idea. So you're not using exactly a religion, but you're using something that it's inside of a, a language that is sacred or something that it's really important for that person. Uh, and, and just think about Hebrew. But let's suppose if you have, um, if you're a Christian or if you have another kind of, of, of religion and you made a mistake, um, it could be uh, something very problematic for that person and can, and, and I think I, I did not try to mix both, both worlds together if you're not very sure with. Sure, sure. Probably a very, um, a very safe way to, to, to operate. Do um, not talk about football, religion, <laughs> and <laughs> inside a hypnotic session, <laughs> and politics. <laughs> that, that's not all forbidding. <laughs> um, we have a, another question here. You, you did touch on it, um, but I'll, I'll ask it again. This is from Felicia Davis, who's with us today. Um, how do you how do you help people? How do you communicate with people that have an overwhelming fear of their death? Well, that's a really good question because I said that uh, eighty percent of the time they are not. They are not afraid of death. They are afraid of the process. But we have 20% of people who are really afraid of death. And I think that we need uh, some simple ways to do it. I think that um, we have to incorporate all, the, all the, the word death inside of our vocabulary, especially because it's something that it's inevitable and we have to face it at least one time in our lives. So we need to do it. And we have to talk about, uh, we, there are so many things, I think there are a lot of different kind of techniques, especially in uh, some therapeutic structures or, or technique, ACT um, has so many uh, strategies just to know how to use hypnotic, uh, it's not a hypnotic, but I mean, just some strategies to talk about death itself. But I want to do something. I want to tell you something. When someone told me I'm very afraid of dying, I would ask that question most of the time that I told, uh, told you um, later. It was, what was, why are you asking me that question? Because most of the time they said, well, I'm, I'm afraid of something that I don't know. So sometimes you have to prepare a special, a special session talking about tolerating uh, uncertainty. Or, or how you can um, tolerate not knowing something that you're willing, I mean, we don't know a lot about it. So that depends on your belief system that we have to think about how it's gonna be the first session with someone who's, who says that it's, uh, uh, they, they have some fear of death. Most of the time it's um, intolerance of, of uncertainty, or ambiguity, we have some problems about uh, trauma or some experience in the past that it was difficult and they have that idea that death is like that. So we have to anal analyze and just go deeper to, to know what is going on there. Okay, well, thank you for that wonderful insight. Um, you've handled a very difficult subject very sensitively um you know you, you've given a lot of people here a lot of food for thought and a lot of advice and insight um we've now come to the end of our our slot 
our scheduled time slot, Dr. Radeska. Um, may I respectfully ask, we've had quite a few people putting some very complimentary stuff about your slides into the chat. Would mm -hmm. you be willing to send us your slides um, so that we can then distribute them in a format to our, uh, our online uh, portal, YouTube? Where we'll yeah. put them into the movie format and share them. Yeah, and, and yeah, of course, no problem. Just uh, uh, you can share. It. Yeah, Thank you very much. And for our audience here today, Daniel, uh, Dr. Daniel has very kindly agreed to um, be in one of the network breakout rooms at the end of the conference. So if you've got any further questions for him, you can either drop them in here or you can put them to him yourself when you go into the breakout room. And for now, I shall hand over to Tom, but thank you again, Dr. Radeska. Thank you all. You're Have welcome. Pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much.